I'd like, if I may, to, to start with one myself. Um, and it picks up on some, something that uh, I thought was very interesting at the end of your book when you're talking about some of these issues. And you say one of the uh, issues that we have to think about is that uh, with these advances in AI, intelligence will become, and that would perhaps already has become, decoupled mm. from consciousness. You haven't talked about consciousness. And that's one thing that I guess, at the moment at least, we feel we have that uh, machines and AI doesn't have. Of course, there's a debate about whether that will ever change. But at the moment, um, it is something that distinguishes us. But I suppose what you've said has raised the question, is there actually an economic value in mm. consciousness? What, what, where do you think consciousness is going to feature in these questions of who will do what? Mm -hmm. Well, I think consciousness at present is the biggest riddle we still haven't solved when it comes to understanding life or to understanding the universe. Uh, a lot of people, especially in the AI business, tend to confuse intelligence with consciousness, but they are very different things. Uh, intelligence is basically the ability to solve problems, and uh, consciousness is the ability to feel things, to have emotions and sensations and subjective experiences. Now, in humans and in all mammals, intelligence and consciousness go together. Uh, the way in which mammals, including humans, solve many problems is through feelings, through emotions. Emotions are not the opposite of rationality, of intelligence. They are the embodiment of evolutionary rationality. So in humans, they go together to such an extent that many people think they are the same thing. Uh, but it's, it's not the same thing. We have other organisms that have sometimes high intelligence without any consciousness. These are, for example, many plants. Many plants, trees, and, and so forth, they are highly intelligent in the way that they solve certain kind of survival problems. But as far as we know, they have no consciousness. They have no feelings, they have no emotions, they don't feel pain, they don't feel love, they don't feel fear. Computers and AI, in this sense, are much more like trees than they are like baboons or giraffes or homo sapiens. They are running, not only just towards intelligence, but towards superintelligence, while bypassing the path of consciousness. They are taking a different route to intelligence than the route that mammals take. And over the last, say, 60, 70, 80 years, there has been a tremendous progress in computer intelligence, there has been exactly zero progress in computer consciousness. In the days of Alan Turing, uh, computers had zero intelligence, uh, sorry, zero consciousness, and today, the best computers in the world still have zero consciousness. As far as we can tell, they have no feelings, they have no emotions, and despite what you see on, in science fiction movies, there is no indication that they are going to develop any kind of consciousness uh, anytime soon. There is no reason to think that they must develop consciousness if they want to become super intelligent. In most science fiction movies, there is this fallacy that uh, the matrix or whatever uh, artificial intelligence is, is fighting against humans, if it's going to be really intelligent, it also must have consciousness. And this fallacy appeals to us because we are mammals, and in mammals, intelligence and consciousness go hand in hand. But computers are not mammals. They're not animals. They are something completely different. So what we may see in the 21st century is the development of uh, super intelligent but completely non-conscious entities. Um, and this is quite frightening. If I spoke in the beginning of the talk about the potential of artificial intelligence of even expanding from planet Earth to the rest of the galaxy, so we have this potential of creating a galaxy, even a universe, full of intelligence but devoid of consciousness. And this is a very scary thought. Um, okay, I want to open it up to questions, and I will try as far as I can to keep an eye on the gallery as well. But um, could I have... Yes, please, sir. Why do you say that humans who are not productive are useless hmm. humans? Um, throughout um, history, and certainly today, a majority of jobs are not fulfilling in any way. Um, 
they're only important because they give access to the fruits of production. They bring you money. Mm -hmm. And so surely the problem is not that um, humans will not be required to do jobs that, human, that uh, machines can do better and quicker and more efficiently and cheaper, uh, but that at the moment there's no uh, means of the distribution mm -hmm. of the fruits of production except through work. Surely that is an important problem, uh, not that people will, in your words, be useless. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I use the, the, the term useless as a provocation, of course, and I, when I say that these are useless humans, it's not from the viewpoint of the mother, of the wife, or the, or the son, it's from the viewpoint of the political and economic system. Now, we could create an unprecedented economic and political model, which for the first time in history really decouples work from having the benefits, the economic benefits. This has never succeeded before in human history, which doesn't mean we shouldn't try. We should definitely uh, explore new models because the old models are fast becoming irrelevant. The danger is that if you become economically useless, so the, so from, from the viewpoint of the political system, you're also losing your importance, your power, and this is a very dangerous position to be in. If you look at what happened in the, in the, eight, in the, sorry, in the 20th century, uh, what you see is that governments throughout the world, not only in liberal democracies, but also in dictatorships, invested a lot in the health and education and welfare of, uh, of ordinary people. Even Nazi Germany, as long as you weren't a Jew or something like that, invested heavily in your education and health and welfare and built hospitals and schools and gave vaccinations to everybody and so forth. Why? Not because Hitler was a very nice person, but because Hitler knew and the Nazi elite knew that if they wanted Germany to be a strong nation with a strong army and a strong economy, they needed these millions of poor Germans to serve as soldiers in the army and as workers in the factories and the offices. Now, if you take this usefulness out of the equation, then the danger is that the state and the elite will stop investing in the health and in the welfare and the education of the masses. It doesn't have to be like that, but from a historical perspective, it is a very big danger. Now, there is talk today about a potential solution, which is a universal basic income that, say, the government will somehow manage to tax Apple and Amazon and Google and all these giants who are extremely creative in, in tax evasion. They'll somehow manage to tax them and use the revenues to provide universal basic income to everybody, uh, which is a model worth exploring, but it's not an easy model because it's not clear what universal and what basic mean. When it comes to universal, so what is universal? Universal is only citizens of the UK, only citizens of the EU, or also the citizens of Bangladesh and Somalia and Sudan and, and so forth. We now have a global economy. If we find a solution that is good for the citizens of the EU, but leaves everybody else outside, this is a very problematic solution. The second question is what does, uni what does basic income mean? What are the basic needs of humans? The basic needs of humans keep changing all the time. I mean, previously people thought, oh, if you just have access to food and shelter, that's it. That's basic needs. But today, certainly in the West, people think that you need far more than just food and shelter uh, if you have your basic needs met. Uh, people say even access to the internet is now a basic human need. If in the 21st century you have revolutions in biotechnology that enable you to extend human life far beyond 80 or 90, will this be a universal human need that everybody are entitled to? Or you'll have a, a, a society in which, you, in which you have ordinary homo sapiens with ordinary uh, health and bodies living until 80? And then you have an elite of superhumans with all kinds of super abilities living indefinitely. Um, so I don't know what the answer is, but certainly it's worth exploring uh, these new models, and we don't have a lot of time to explore them. 
Yuval, can I um, perhaps expand on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, because it, it occurs to me from what you say that, and from the, the question, that underpinning some of this are, are issues of morality, of where, what we feel is a moral solution to this. And mm -hmm. I, I can't help wondering whether some of those, you know, we have a sense that perhaps there is something intrinsic in our moral instincts, but I can't help feeling that from what you've said, and certainly a lot of aspects of morality perhaps emerge from an economic model. Mm. The idea that, you know, it is... Uh, uh, that, that, that we, we should work, the Protestant work ethic is a, you know, a moral position that sort of reflects the fact that otherwise you won't have any economic worth, that mm -hmm. perhaps it follows from the economic model. So where do you think morality is likely, if at all, to figure in all of this? It, it, certainly if it's the case that morality sometimes emerges from our economic structures rather than mm. informs them, how is that going to, to figure in the future? Uh, we definitely have to put a greater emphasis on, on morality and on ethics because the economic argument will become weaker. In the 20th century, you had two basic uh, arguments why governments and states need to liberalize the economy, liberalize the political system, uh, protect human, human rights, protect the rule of law, provide health and, and, and health care and education and so forth. One was the ethical argument. Uh, this is the good thing to do. Uh, the other was the neoliberal capitalist argument that if you want to be a successful economy, then you need to liberalize the economy. You need to release the creativity of people. You need to, pro to have the rule of law to protect pro property and so forth. And as a historian, I think it's, it's a sad truth, but it's still a truth, that the economic argument was far, far more important than the ethical argument. The reason why countries, say, like China or like Turkey, liberalized their economy and their, and their society was not that bec they became convinced of the ethical argument, mm -hmm. it's that be they became convinced of the economic argument. And once we take away the economic argument, say in the 21st century, once you no longer need to protect human rights or to provide universal health care in order to have a thriving economy, then I'm afraid that the ethical argument by itself will not be enough. Right. Thank you. Um, yes, other questions, please. Uh, yes, there's one uh, up here. If you can wait till the microphone gets to you, then we'll hear it better. You've posited an accelerated development of both organic and inorganic life and suggested that inorganic life has an advantage certainly outside the planet. Does organic life have any advantages or are we likely to end up, even if we're superhumans, as the pets or zoo attractions of inorganic computers? Well, at present, we know of one big thing that organic life has and inorganic life uh, does not seem to have, which is consciousness. Uh, the mind. And the problem is we don't understand consciousness and the mind very well. We're making amazing progress in understanding the body and the brain and intelligence. We're making far less progress in understanding the mind and consciousness. We don't know how we, we assume, biologists assume, that somehow mind emerges from brain that when billions of neurons in the brain are firing in a particular pattern, then somehow, out of this electrochemical storm, subjective experiences of love and hate and pain and joy emerge. And we are becoming quite good in uh, recognizing um, correlations. That when this type of electrochemical storm is happening in this part of the brain, we know that the person is probably feeling angry. And when another type of electrochemical storm is happening, the person is probably feeling fear. But we have no idea how the firing of billions of neurons create a subjective experience, and we don't even know what could possibly be its function. Why do the, in addition to all the cascades of electrochemical events in the brain, why do you need this second layer of mind and mental events? We just have no idea. 
and we are not investing uh, enough effort in that direction. And the, the danger is that we'll end up upgrading bodies and brains and losing our mind in the process without even understanding what we are losing. Good. Um, I, when computers came about, the prediction was that we will work three-day weeks. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> Uh, the reality is that we are spending long days behind the computer in bullshit jobs. So the new jobs which have been created, which do not create anything, like media jobs, I work in media so I'm allowed to say that, um, don't you think there'll be new bullshit jobs created? And secondly, um, those jobs which are not bullshit jobs, won't they be doing something of a higher caliber, something that AI won't be able to do? in the end of the day, who will create a new IBM Watson? Hmm. Well, there could be a lot of new bullshit jobs. Humans are very good in creating such, such things. But the question is whether humans will be better than the computers in the bullshit jobs. <laughs> because even there, AI is gaining on us. Uh, you already start seeing like the first articles in sports and in, 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 in economics being written by algorithms. Um, and things that 10 years ago, uh, people all laughed at Google Translate, that it's completely useless, and it makes, makes these terrible, terrible mistakes, so it's still very far from what a human translator can do, but in many cases, in many texts, especially more technical texts, you can put the Chinese text into the Google Translate, and you get a fair sense of, of, what, of, of what is there, and who knows where it will be in 20 or 30 years. Um, so the, the, the big question is not creating new jobs, it's creating new jobs that humans still do better uh, than AI. And frankly, we just don't know. Uh, we are, for the first time in history, we are in a position that nobody has the faintest idea how the job market would look like in 30 or 40 years. Uh, if you go back, say, to the Middle Ages or even to the 19th century. So there are many things you didn't know about the future. At any time, there could be an invasion from the Vikings or the Mongols might invade. You could have a flood, you could have a plague. Lots of un un unexpected things may happen. But the basics of human life, including the job market, you knew how the job market would look in 30 years, which is why you trained your son or your daughter uh, in the appropriate skills. Uh, if you're a peasant, you taught them how to harvest the, the corn and how to grind the corn and how to bake bread because you knew these are the kind of skills they will need in 40 years. Today, we have absolutely no idea what to teach children because nobody knows what kind of skills they will need in 2050. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations in the line to that? <laughs> Um, I think the best bet under current conditions is to invest in emotional intelligence and emotional resilience because the one thing we are certain about the world of the 21st century is that it will be extremely chaotic with a lot of changes and for the first time in history, people will have to reinvent themselves throughout their lives. I mean, the previous model of life which held true until the 20th century, including the 20th century, was of a life divided into two periods. In the first period, until your teens and 20s, you mostly learn, and then in the second period, you mostly work. You make use of what you learned in the first period. This is, will no longer be relevant. Uh, by the time you're 40 or 50, most of what you learned in your teens is completely irrelevant. So the basic skill you will need is a lot of emotional resilience and the ability to keep learning, to keep changing, to keep reinventing yourself throughout your life, which is very, very difficult. Right. I notice there are probably some teenagers here, but you may need to keep going to school at the moment um, but, uh, <laughs> with a pinch of salt. Um, qu questions, uh, more questions. Yes, uh, there, I, I'll, I'll take, yes, yes, please, yes, in the middle there, and then, and then I'll take you. <clears throat> yeah, no, uh, could we <laughs> return to the subject of consciousness because you've implied that consciousness is a direct result of neuronal activity. Now, there is a whole 
spectrum of consciousness from basic stimulus and response, which could be said to be the result of neuronal, direct result of neuronal activity. And at the other end of the spectrum is human self-conscious awareness, which is not the direct result and cannot be reduced to neuronal activity. It results from humans living in a community using a language in which to relate to each other, and formulate and solve problems. Personally, I don't think at present we have a good scientific theory or explanation for consciousness. Um, a lot of people in the life sciences adhere to the dogma, which is at present just a dogma, that somehow consciousness, all consciousness, emerges from neuronal activities in the brain. But we are very far from having a theory which explains how it happens. And I wouldn't be surprised if during the 21st century we come to the conclusion that this is not the case, that you cannot reduce mind to brain and that you cannot reduce consciousness uh, to just neural activities uh, in the brain which doesn't mean that we then go back to traditional religious visions about there is a soul, there is a spirit. No, I think we need to go forward and develop uh, this branch of science much more deeply and carefully, uh, the science of consciousness as against the, the brain sciences. And again, as I said, I'm afraid we are not doing it fast enough. When I mean, we are investing a lot uh, in the study of brain, partly in the hope of uh, deciphering intelligence and creating superintelligence, and we are not investing enough in the study of consciousness and subjective experiences. You, you made the point earlier, and you make it in your book, that um, it's still not clear w what value consciousness has, that mm -hmm. you know, even for social cooperativity, there are creatures, ants do it, or that we assume don't have a high degree of consciousness, um, which is interesting because I guess often the assumption is that there's clearly an adaptive value to us mm -hmm. being conscious, um, but you, you feel that we haven't established what that is or even whether there necessarily is one. Yes, uh, again, the, the common assumption there must be some, some uh, val uh, adaptive value in that, and people say, oh, it's obvious, we need to feel fear, so if a lion comes, we run away. But as we study the brain more and more, then we understand what is the biochemical uh, cascade that leads from uh, the vision of the lion, from the activity in the eyes, how it goes through billions of neurons and ends in our legs moving and we running away from the lion. What we don't understand is why in all this biochemical cascade, we also need the second layer of actually feeling fear. Why, not, why can't it all happen if you take like a, a billion dominoes and one uh, uh, makes the, the other fall and, and so forth? They don't need consciousness in, do it, in order to do it. So why do the billions of neurons in the brain, what does consciousness do in addition to what the neurons are doing? And we don't have any explanation for that. At present, I think the best theory we have is that consciousness is some kind of mental pollution. <laughs> that it's just an inevitable byproduct of the firing of the neurons, which does absolutely nothing. It's like uh, somebody uh, compared it, I think, to the roar of the engine, of a jet engine, when a plane is, fire, uh, is flying. The noise, it doesn't do anything, it's not needed, it's just there. So also consciousness, it has no practical purposes at all. It's just a kind of pollution created when these billions of neurons are firing. Um, I personally am not very, feel very good about this explanation. <laughs> um, I think not we alone. just have to keep on researching. Mm -hmm. right. Could I take the next question? Please? Going back to the society with uh, economically useless people, as you call them, uh, presumably these people will still be consumers. Mm. So consumerism will have to play part in the way the society is structured. I wondered what are your thoughts about that? Yes, one, again, one theory is that humans, the ultimate value of humans will be just as consumers. 
that will do nothing useful at all, but the economy needs consumers. However, you could have consumers which are not humans, which are not conscious. Uh, in a very simple system, you can have, for example, uh, a corporation managed by algorithms which mines ore, iron and nickel and, and, and so forth, and another corporation which processes metals and produces robots that then it sells back to the mining corporation, and the mining corporation sells the, 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 the product of the mine to the robot co corporation, and they trade and they make billions of dollars, and you don't need any humans as consumers. Nobody, but this is how the economy functions. I mean, what is the product of the economy at present? Nothing. I mean, if you look at the economy from outside, it's just a closed system. It does nothing from the outside. So if you have an economy, it's of course a very simplified version, but to make it easier to think about it. If you have just these two corporations trading with one another and mining more and more ore and sending spaceships to other planets to mine iron on Mars and Pluto and so forth, you get an expanding and very successful economy without any human consumers, without any consciousness, which can go on indefinitely. And even today, we are starting to see this uh, phenomena of non-human or non-conscious consumers. If you look at the advertising industry, so the most important consumer, the most important client of the advertisement industry today is no longer human beings, they are algorithms, and above all, one particular algorithm, which is the Google algorithm. If you want your product to be successful, if I want my book to be successful, my number one client is the Google algorithm. And I know this for a fact, because when they ask me to write this blurb or something, describe the book in, in, in 10 words or 20 words, so they have these experts which know what the Google algorithm pays attention to, and they say, no, don't say it like this, say it like that, because then the Google algorithm will, will notice you more. So we are already in a stage when at least in some areas, the most important consumer is a non-conscious algorithm. That's very interesting. There's a, a question right at the back there. I'm sorry, I can't see if, even if you're male or female, but uh, yes, please. Right, thank you. Now I can. <clears throat> Um, don't you think that human beings in the future won't be dissociated from AI, but instead will be kind of augmented human mm. beings uh, uh, using AI to be more performant uh, during, uh, in our jobs, and instead of working for eight hours, we'll be then working only for three hours, which will leave us more time, which will free us uh, further to do whatever we want in life, like singing, yoga, you know, <laughs> art, painting, whatever. Uh, yes, th that's definitely a possibility that will create this not useless class, but, but leisured class. And people will have far more free time and, and, and so forth. Um, again, part of the problem is that if, you if the state gives you the necessary conditions, the food, the shelter, everything, then you can spend all your days just uh, listening to music or creating music or whatever. But... It's from a historical perspective, it's very dangerous to be in a situation when you are expendable, when the system doesn't need you. Now, we could see a merger of humans with AI, of humans with computers, and it's clear what humans will get out of it. It's less clear what a highly intelligent AI might get out of such, such a merger. So... I'm not saying that it, it won't happen. It's another possibility worth uh, exploring. But um, I all the time try to get back to the basic social and economic and, and political reality. Because I think, and, and you mentioned it at the beginning of, of when you introduced this subject, that a lot of futurology at present is far too much uh, fascinated by the technical aspects of AI and robots and biotechnology and we can do this and we can do that and it's too divorced from the uh, grey day-to-day realities of economics and politics. And technology is never deterministic. 
the mere fact that something can be done through a, a certain technology does not guarantee that it will actually be done, that it will actually, be ha it will actually happen. With the same technology, you could create completely different societies. If we look back at the Industrial Revolution, so with the same technology of trains and electricity and radio, you could create a communist dictatorship, you could create a fascist regime, and you could create a liberal democracy. The trains and the electricity didn't tell you what to do with them. So similarly, in the 21st century, there are all kinds of possibilities that are opened up by biotechnology and AI and so forth, but it's not deterministic, and at the end of the day, there will still be political and economic decisions that uh, will determine, will decide what the direction uh, will be. Sorry, thank you. Um, there's a recurring theme of rate or speed of change, and that's bringing about an idea of urgency. Can you just talk about whether humanity is able to deal with this rate of change mm. when we think about historical experience, historical evidence? Yeah, one of the big problems of what's happening now is that the rate of change is accelerating, and I think that and for the first time in history, technology is outpacing politics. I mean, previously, even in the 19th and 20th century, despite the amazing technological changes, politics was still able to keep up, uh, to understand what is happening, to understand what are the potential implications, what are the various models, the various solutions we can adopt, and you could still have a political process deciding what kind of society we want to create using the new technology. Now, technology seems to be outpacing politics, uh, so the political institutions and the political processes are left far behind, and they have less and less influence on the direction that the technological revolution is taking. To give a concrete example, over the last 20 years, maybe the most important change in the world was the rise of the internet. This changed the daily life, the economy, the society, the politics, more than almost anything else. Uh, it touched upon traditional political issues, like state sovereignty, like security, like privacy. But the decisions about the shape of the internet were not taken by any traditional political process. Uh, there, there could have been different kinds of internets. We are familiar with the version that emerged, but this is not the only possible uh, way to create an internet. Decisions were made in the 1980s and in the 1990s about the shape of the internet, but not by the traditional political process. I never voted about the shape of the internet, it was never an issue in any uh, political campaign, in any elections in Israel. And I think this is true of uh, all countries. Uh, very few uh, political parties have any policy on the, on the internet, how would it, it would look like. Maybe they have policies on very particular points, like who controls the data or taxation of the tech giants, but they don't really have any serious vision about what they want the internet uh, to look like. And um, this is, will only uh, accelerate in the, in the coming decades. So already today, we're in a very curious and frightening position when um, we don't have any political vision for the future. Traditionally, Politics was a battleground between visions, different visions about the human future. Of course, there was day-to-day -day issues of all kinds of sex scandals and things like that, but the big thing about politics is that you have two or more groups with very different visions about the future of the country or the future of humanity, and the political process is meant to find some kind of, 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 uh, uh, of solution or compromise. This is how it was in the 20th century, when you had these huge visions, the communist vision, the fascist vision, the liberal vision, everybody had this big vision about the future of humanity. Now, nobody has any serious vision about the future of humanity, except perhaps 
for a few silicon gurus in, in California. Uh, neither the right nor the left has any meaningful vision of how to use biotechnology and artificial intelligence in order to create this kind of society or that kind of society. If you look at the elections in the United States at present, so you don't hear anybody talking about it. Uh, Donald Trump has no views, as far as I know, about artificial intelligence, and it's likely not because he's hiding something. I don't think he's capable <laughs> of hiding... Uh, <laughs> I don't think he's capable of hiding some very important views, keeping it to himself. It's just not part of the politi political landscape, uh, which means either of two things, that nobody is thinking about it, or that it has become the monopoly of a very small group of engineers and entrepreneurs in places like Silicon Valley. And it's good that they are thinking about it, at least somebody does it, but it's bad that nobody else is doing it, especially because they don't really represent anybody except themselves. So I think what is very urgent is to start a political debate about these issues before it is too late. And politicians and also the public need to, uh, need to move faster before technology completely outpaces them and they lose their ability to do anything about the future of humanity and the future of life. Do you think it's also the case that political philosophies in general have been based on particular ideas about human nature? Those ideas mm -hmm. might differ, but the political philosophy starts with an idea of what humans are like. Mm -hmm. But it seems that we, we're more mutable than that, and we, we are changing our behaviour in response to technology. Mm. So perhaps is that one of the challenges to, and it you know, relates to this question of, of change and how we respond to it, is that one of the challenges for formulating mm. a sort of political vision that actually, you know, because of the way technologies have gone, we are doing things, we are doing things now that we wouldn't have imagined we would be doing um, 20 or 30 years ago. How um, do we factor in um, the mutability of, of or, or it, how mutable is human nature, I suppose? I think this is really a key issue, maybe the key issue, because previously in history, you had like two sides of the equation. You had things changing uh, in technology, in economics, in society. But then you had an immutable human nature. The assumption is that this does not change. So the political question was, how do you, um, given a constant human nature, how do you make use of a new technology like steam engines mm -hmm. or like electricity? Uh, and so we changed the world outside us, and there was a big political debate how to change the world outside us, whether to create, again, a communist society or a liberal democracy. But the basis was that human nature itself is the constant. Now, when we start having the opportunity to change human nature, we don't have any constant on which to stand and to say, OK, I want to change human nature in such and such a way. And in this sense, politics is still stuck in the old 19th century, 20th century debates, and it is not coming to terms with the real revolutions of the 21st century. Right. Thank you. Um, I have time for uh, one. Can we take it right at the back there? Yes, with your hand up. Um, I think we'll probably have to call that in. But yes. Hi, thank you. Um, as for the American presidential debate, there actually was one transhumanist candidate, Zoltan Istvan, <laughs> who uh, probably most of the people haven't heard of, but he was actually a very techno-progressive candidate who was sidelined very early on. But more, <laughs> more to the point, um, can I get your opinion about this idea of liability um, and kind of dispersion of liability? Because one of the things that's stopping those... Um, doctors in your phone from being taken up by wider society is the idea of trust and liability. Mm. So I want to go to a physical doctor because if something goes wrong, I can always sue him. I can, <laughs> um, uh, you know, restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, whilst with an app, we, who do I go to? Who do I sue? Who do I mm. get my retribution from? And we do see this issue of liability with drones, 
you know, all those technologies Driverless whereby cars, it's yeah. all dispersed. Yeah. So mm -hmm. is it the billionaires? Is it the share shareholders who will have to take the hit? Do we have a massive fund to absorb all those claims? People will be just scared of hmm. trusting technologies because what if something goes wrong? What's the mm -hmm. recourse? Uh, yes, that's a, that's a very, very good point. I think in, in many cases, the major problems are not technical at all. The major problems are legal and political. This is why it's so important when we have these discussions about the future, about driverless cars and so forth, that it's not just an issue for engineers explaining us technical stuff. The really interesting issues relate to legal issues, and legal issues, of course, relate back to politics and to ethics, uh, to morality. But uh, solutions will appear. I mean, once we start, once the potential is there, and it's definitely there, you'll start seeing more and more uh, new models of how to solve these uh, legal issues. It will provide at least some work to some humans, lawyers and, 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 and politicians, until AI will take over uh, even that. The interesting, the really interesting thing is that I think ethics and philosophy will become much more important than in any previous time in history because they will have far more practical implications. A lot of ethical debates that have been going on for thousands of years between philosophers and had very little impact on actual reality will suddenly become practical questions of engineering. And I'll give an example <clears throat> with driverless cars. So if somebody here ever studied philosophy at college or, or university, so there is all these annoying trolley problems. You know that first year class in ethics, you have a trolley and it's going to hit five people, but if you sidetrack it, it will just kill one person, or you can uh, drop into a precipice and you kill yourself and you save the five people, so what do you do? Now, uh, philosophy students and philosophers have been arguing about it for thousands and thousands of years with very little practical implications about <laughs> how people actually behave, because even if you say in theory, yes, this is the right thing to do, when you actually find yourself in that real-life situation, you very often behave in a completely different way. Because most of human action is not really determined by intellectual beliefs or even religious beliefs. They are determined by completely different mechanisms. Now, it suddenly becomes a much more important issue when you have driverless cars. Because in a human, even if you tell this human being every week at church for 30 years, you must behave like this, when real-life situation occurs, he or she may do something completely different. With an AI, with an algorithm that drives a car, if you program it to behave in a particular way, you have a 99% guarantee that it will indeed behave in such a way. So if Tesla or Google or Toyota is now engineering the first fully autonomous driverless car, they need to know how to program the algorithm. If indeed the car is driving on the highway and suddenly the car notices, the algorithm, the AI, and notices that it is about to run over five pedestrians. And there is no way to avert this except by swerving to the side, falling off a precipice and killing the single person inside the car that owns the car. What, how should we design the algorithm? This is a practical question of engineering. This is not a theoretical question of philosophy. Um, there could be all kinds of solutions. Uh, given that we live in a capitalist neoliberal society, I guess somebody up there in Google or Toyota will say, let's just leave it to market forces. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll design and build two all. cars. We'll, which one sells. we'll build the Toyota Altruist <laughs> that falls off a of precipice. <laughs> And we also go on the market with the Toyota Egoist that drives <laughs> over these five people. And the, the customer is always right. The customers <laughs> will, will decide. 
so in this way, these philosophical problems will become engineering problems. <laughs> well, if, if all this, <laughs> yes, that's very nice.